Now, friends, today our study brings us to the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. We are still in this section here that we have labeled in our notes that you have concerning Christian liberty. And now we are going to see it in another area, and the illustration that will be given to us will, of course, be the nation Israel. Now he says, "...moreover, brethren..." And he had just said in the last chapter, the last verse, in fact, the last thing he had said, he says that, "...lest that by any means when I preach to others..." I myself should be disapproved. Paul said that he did not want to be disapproved at the judgment seat of Christ. He wanted to receive a reward. Now he goes on, he says, Moreover, brethren, now that begins chapter 10, are for, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. And here we go again. When Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, you can always put it down that the brethren are ignorant. And they are here about this. He says, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, the church in Corinth, largely a Gentile church, but made up with probably just as many of the nation Israel. We think today that a Jewish Christian is something that's unusual. Well, back in those days, they thought a Gentile Christian was something unusual. And now he says, for all our fathers. But he may not be including the church, and I'm sure he's not. In this, when he says all our fathers, he means those of us who are Israelites. And Paul happened to be one of them. He said, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, now not with all of them, but with many of them, and actually the word in the Greek means, but with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now this shows how far you can go and still be a believer. And it reveals to you what wonderful liberty these people had when they crossed the Red Sea. See, the law had not been given at that time. And at that particular time, they were not under law. They had great liberty, but they abused that liberty. And always, privilege is no insurance against ultimate failure. That is something that many a rich man's son has had to learn, and many a man who's had certain privileges granted him in politics, in the political realm, or in the business world, or in the social world, or in any world for that matter. And these people now, they were under the cloud. That is, they had guidance. They all went through the sea. But it says they were all baptized unto Moses. Now, what does it mean? And here again, we're going to see an illustration of that word baptize, which we've talked about before, and we need to emphasize that again here. Baptize means many things. I have a classical lexicon here, a Greek classical lexicon. I can give you 20 meanings for the word baptizo. And our translators never did translate it. They transliterated it. They just took it out of Greek and spelled it in the same word in English. Now, to try to say dogmatically what they had in mind would be very difficult because they didn't attempt to do that. All they did was just to spell it out. And today, a great many folk have it narrowed down to a very narrow meaning. 
Now, it means to identify. In fact, the water baptism is that. It speaks of our identification with Christ. We are buried with him by baptism, by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. He identifies us with the body of Christ. He takes us and puts us in as a member. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now, we're going to get that in this epistle just a little later on. But here we have it. And so how were they baptized under Moses? Now, don't try to tell me that Moses had a baptismal service at the Red Sea and baptized him, because actually they did not get wet at all. It says they went over on dry ground, dry shot. That means that the sand was not even damp that they walked over on. It was dry. When God dried up the Red Sea for them, friends, he dried it up. They didn't have to go around any pools of water. Wasn't anything like that at all. But they didn't get in water. They didn't even get enough to dampen a wash rag. Wasn't that much for them. Now, the folks that really got wet were the Egyptians. They really got wet. They were soaked through and through. Now, don't then tell me that this happens to be water, because we're not talking about that obviously here. And certainly it's not the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It says they were baptized under Moses. Now, what does that mean? Well, it simply means they were identified with Moses, because the 11th chapter of Hebrews says that by faith they crossed the Red Sea, which the Egyptians were attempted to do. They were drowned. They got wet. But the children of Israel, they were identified under Moses. It says by faith they crossed the Red Sea. Whose faith was it? wasn't theirs. They had none. Read the story. They wanted to go back to Egypt, and they were blaming Moses for bringing them out there into that awful wilderness. They wanted to go back, but it was Moses' faith. Moses went down. It was Moses who smote the Red Sea. It was Moses' rod that opened up those waters, and then he led them across. And when they came to the other side, what did they do? Read the record. It says they sang the song of Moses. And my, what a song it was. They are now identified under Moses. Now, that, may I say to you, is the picture, actually, of our salvation. Christ went through the waters of death, and we are brought through, through his death, identified with him. And we are brought through where now we are identified to a living Savior. And we are baptized into Christ. And that's the way baptism saves us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, that when we trust Christ, we're put in Christ. Now, water baptism illustrates that and is very important. But it's ritual baptism. Real baptism is of the Holy Spirit. So what we have here, these were baptized under Moses. And they were able to cross the Red Sea. They all ate the same spiritual meat, the manna. They drank from the rock. We're told that rock was Christ, sets him forth. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. Why? They were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, why is that given to us? We're told now why this is given to us. Now, all these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. We see in these first five verses an illustration of the liberty that these people had as a nation. Now we see in this most searching section here that these people abuse their liberty, and he makes application of it. For us today. It happened unto them for examples to us. Now, will you notice it was written, therefore, for you and for me today, and we ought to pay attention to it. And you'll notice here that these people had all this wonderful liberty, but what did they do? Well, we're told here that they lusted after evil things. And what were these things? They are mentioned to us in Numbers, the 11th chapter, the fourth verse. And many of you will recall that when we went through that, 
that they lusted after the leeks, the onions, and the garlic back in the land of Egypt. Everything they wanted grew on the ground or under the ground, if you will notice. They said, oh boy, if we could only get back there, we remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. I want to tell you, (laughs) they wouldn't make very good companions to walk along with them. And they didn't like the manna. They lusted, we're told, after evil things. Was there anything wrong with leeks, onions, and garlic? Well, it is if you're going to have company with you. And they lusted, and actually they desired, we're told. What does it mean by that? Well, that was the beginning of the defection of these people. Have you noticed how many places that it's desire that leads to sin? It started it all back in the Garden of Eden. It says, when she saw that the tree was good for food and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Desire? What is that? It's a desire for something outside of the will of God. Now, what is desire? Well, I can't answer it. I wish some psychologist would answer it. I do not mean to constantly reflect on the psychologist. I do not want to be disrespectful to them, but you ask the next one to tell you what desire is. They haven't been able to yet. They talk about inhibitions and prohibitions, and they talk about desire, the supreme thing in life. Well, what is desire after all? Well, here it's to want that which is outside the will of God. It wasn't the will of God for them to have these things. They had them in Egypt, but not now. And it says, "...neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play." And idolatry is anything you put in the place of God in your life. And again in verse 8, "...neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed fell in one day three and twenty thousand. The sin is of these people. And then we're told, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of the serpents. Remember, they were told to look away to that brazen serpent in order to be saved. These people had continually murmured and complained against God. Verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, this is an illustration of those who want those things that are outside the will of God. God always today, always today, has something good for his people, but they constantly want something beyond the will of God. Now, will you notice... We read in verse 11, another now. Now, all these things happen unto them for ensamples. They are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. Now, we are to learn a lesson from this. Our desire today is in the realm of the will of God. That's important, very important. Now, we're told... In verse 12, "...wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall." I don't care who you are, you could fall today. It would be very easy for you to blunder and stumble and fall. I don't care what saint you are. Therefore, you and I today need to be very careful that we stay in the realm of the will of God where we are not quenching the Spirit of God in our lives." Now he goes on. Now all these things happen on them, for example. They're written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now, let's continue. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And a great many people today think that My, nobody's ever had to be tempted like I am. Well, you've never had a temptation, my friend, that others haven't had the same kind of a temptation. 
And the very interesting thing is that God makes a way of escape for you, though, but God's faithful. He'll not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. We need to recognize, Dr. Hutton used to say, he said, God always makes a way of escape, and sometimes the way of escape is the king's highway and a good pair of heels. That is, you let the devil see your heels, and that means you're running as hard as you can to get away from the temptation. And I think one of the reasons that a great many folk fall is sort of like the little boy. His mother heard a noise back in the kitchen at night. The little fellow was in the pantry, and he had the cookie jar down, and she said, Willie, where are you? And Willie said, I'm in the pantry. And she said, what are you doing? He says, I'm fighting temptation. My friend, that's not the place to fight temptation. You've got to start running. <laughs> Many of us need to get away from it like the little girl, for instance. And I think I've told this before, that she fell out of bed at night and began to cry. Mother came, picked her up, put her back in bed, and the mother said, how come you to fall out of bed? And she said, I think I stayed too close to the place where I got in. And that's another reason that a great many Christians fall today. They don't get very far in as a believer. They don't go on with God, not in the will of God. Now we are told here, verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. And idolatry was one thing there. It would not be a temptation today other than covetousness is idolatry, and there's a lot of that around today. Verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion? of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now he's moved into the realm of the Lord's Supper, by the way. For we being many are one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices, partakers of the altar? What say I then? At the idol... Is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols, is anything? Paul's argument here is quite logical. He says an idol is nothing. So if you offer something to an idol, that's nothing. It doesn't affect the meat at all. But he says, verse 20, still talking about Christian liberty, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with demons. Now, back of that sacrifice and that idol, that was demonism. And Paul recognized that. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. That is, to eat things sacrificed to idols, for some people wouldn't be just this. And you'd need to recognize that. Now he says, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now, here in this section of this 10th chapter, Paul comes back to what he said at the very beginning of this section on Christian liberty. He speaks here of the fact, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, Paul says, I have freedom to do these questionable things. That is, Paul said, if I felt that I wanted to go to the races, I would go. That is, the races in his day would be the great Olympic events that took place. I think Paul went because he surely uses a great many illustrations that are taken from the athletic events that were carried on in the great coliseums and stadiums of that day. But Paul says, it's lawful for me, but it's not always expedient because of the fact that the very thing that I'm doing, it might hurt or harm some other believer, a weaker believer. Paul says, things are lawful for me, but all things do not edify. That is, 
They don't build me up in the faith. And a young preacher said to me several years ago about this matter, he said, you think that a preacher ought to go? For instance, he used the term ball games. He knew I didn't go. Well, I said very candidly, my hang-up is not baseball. I used to enjoy playing it, and I've always enjoyed participating in all athletic events, but I've never been very much of a spectator at any of them. I don't care too much about going to watch somebody else play football or play baseball, especially when they're being paid for it. I always played for fun and enjoyed it. But I said to this young man this statement. I said, when I was in school, I read a book that said that anything that a preacher can use in his ministry, in his experience of where he goes, what he sees, and that he ought to confine his life to that because his total life is his ministry. And therefore, as this book said, everything should be grist for his mill. In other words, a minister should take into the pulpit his entire life and not have a hidden part at all, be able to use all of it. And I told him, I said, if you can use the baseball game, and you can. I think there are many good illustrations that come from that, and there'd be nothing wrong in that. But it might be that it might not be expedient, that is, influence on somebody else. Now he says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Means, of course... The other man's welfare. And therefore, a Christian's life should be directed and dictated not primarily by liberty. We have that liberty. The Christian has a tremendous liberty in Christ, and he's not pinned down by legality. He's not circumscribed by strict rules. Liberty is limited, of course, by love. It's what you want to do to influence and affect others. And that is the thought that Paul has here. You notice in that great second chapter of Philippians, Paul says everything is to be done with others in mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, the basis of this is just simply this, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that is, in the meat market, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so we can enjoy the things of this world. Now, when I say world, I mean creation, the beauties of it, the produce of it, and all of that is something for believers to enjoy. It's the Lord's. He's provided. Now, he says, when you go in to eat, don't ask where the meat came from or that sort of thing. You might say, well, my, this is a very lovely steak that you have today, brother. Where did you get it? My butcher doesn't turn out meat like that to the public. And he might tell you that he went and bought it at the temple. The best thing to do is not to ask him. Now, Paul's using this very practical illustration here. Listen to this, verse 27 now of chapter 10. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever set before you, eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. Now, that's the important thing. But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, the whole point is that if he's eating there, and he's not to ask questions, but if his host volunteers where he got it, and it had been offered to an idol, now Paul says you're not to eat it. Not because there's any rule, there's no rule. Not because you think it's wrong, but you want to help that brother. That's the whole point, my friend. I remember down in Georgia, they have down there a berry they call the scuppignon. It's something like a grape, but it's not a grape. It just grows singly on a vine, and they make wine out of it. 
friend of mine told me he went to preach in a certain church, invited out to dinner by one of the officers of the church, and he was handed a glass. He didn't know what it was. He tasted of it. He saw that it was something that had alcohol in it. Now, he's not being super pious because this friend of mine's not that type of individual, but he put it down. And as a minister, why, the man said to him, well, what's the matter with it? Don't you like it? Oh, he said, I think it's delicious. But he said, I noticed that it is a wine, apparently. And he said, I feel that I should not drink it as a Christian. Well, that made a tense moment there for just a moment or two. But he got his point over, and I feel like that he was certainly right. Now, the question would arise, does that minister have as much right to drink that as the elder does? Well, he does. There's no question about that. But he does have a testimony, and that is the thing that I wish that today I could get so many Christians that are harsh in their dealings with others because of the legality of it. I don't do this. You shouldn't do it. But their motive is legality. Now, if they can change it to love, it will be an altogether different approach. And that's the reason and should be the motive for a Christian not doing certain things. Now, he says here, conscience, I say, not thine own, but the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Now, why should I be restricted by some of these weak brethren. For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Now, the thing is, Paul says that it's unfair to judge me because of another man's conscience. Now, Paul says, but whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, my friend, this is not a rule, but it's a great principle. Paul has stated certain great principles here that relate to Christian liberty. One of those principles is, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, here's another one. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And my friend, that is the test of every believer. Can I do this or can I not? Should I do this or should I not? Can you do it for the glory of God? And I'm of the opinion there's some people that don't even go to church for the glory of God. And if you're not going for the glory of God, then I'd say stay home. That'd be the best thing to do. And I'm sure the attitude and action of certain people, of the saints, their criticism, their gossip, their harshness, their bitterness that's in their hearts, going to church, my friend, actually becomes a sin. Because what a believer does, he should do it for the glory of God. That's the important thing. In fact, that's the all-important thing. Now, he says here, give none offense. None. And he divides the human family into three groups. And I think we have those three groups today. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Now, we should not offend folk who have certain beliefs relative to diet, for instance. I think that it would be wrong to invite an Orthodox Jewish friend to your home and serve him a well, a ham. I think that that would just be the wrong thing to do. We're to give none offense in these matters, nor are the Gentiles. Now, there are a lot of Gentiles with some very peculiar notions today. Now, I don't propose myself to attempt to please all of these. In fact, there are a lot of, may I say, radical and way out yonder thinking today. But we ought not to offend them, nor to the church of God. Now, some young people that are the hippie type, they came to me and they said to me some time ago, we went to a certain church and we were rebuked because of our dress. Don't you think that they were wrong? 
Well, there are two things. I think both groups are wrong. I told these young people, I said, they were wrong in criticizing you. They shouldn't have done it, especially verbally before others. I think they were wrong in that. But also, I think you were wrong to go like you were. You were Christians. You had your Bible. You were offending them. And we are told today we're not to offend in these matters, neither the Jews nor the Gentiles nor the church of God. Those are the three great divisions of the human family today. And one of these days, the church of God is going to leave this earth. Then you're going to have Jews and Gentiles in the world. And then God has a tremendous program that will take place at that time. Now, Paul says here, "...even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved." Now. Primarily, what we do, we are to do for the glory of God. Whatsoever we do, whether it be to eat or drink or anything, do it to the glory of God. And I think a Christian can, well, I think a housewife can wash the dishes, sweep the floor. A man can dig a ditch. He can mow the lawn. Whatever you do, you can do it to the glory of God. I don't care what it is. Well, if you can't do it to the glory of God, you ought not to be doing it. And we ought to remember that all of this is that there might be those that are lost that might be saved. And it's more important, friends, to make tracks in the world than to give out tracks. This is what a very wise black man said to a person who was very zealous in giving out tracks in Memphis, Tennessee. This man was coming down the street handing out tracts to everybody, and he handed one to this black man, and he said to him, What is that? He says, It's a tract. Oh, he said, I can't read it. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do, though. I'll watch your tracts. And believe me, friends, that's much more impressive. And you can read those lots better than you can read the tracts. Hand out, and don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying you're not to hand out tracts, but I am saying that it's very important to make the right kind of tracts. Now, we come to chapter 11, and actually this first verse belongs back, to, I think, to the other uh, chapter. It says, "...be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ." And that is something that I dare say that very few of us, well, I ought not to sit in judgment on you, that's for sure, But that's something that I dare not say. I want you to be a follower of Paul and a follower of the Lord Jesus, and not to look to me. But isn't that a tremendous statement? Now we come to hear another division, and this is concerning woman's dress, by the way, of all things. And this is something else that they had asked about, you see. Now, will you notice, Paul says, now... I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul says, I praise you. Up to this point, he says, I praise you not. But now, he says, I praise you because you remember me in all things. They remembered Paul in their prayers and in their giving. Now, Paul, again, puts down a great principle. He says, "...but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God." And I know that there are those today that like to emphasize that middle statement, the head of the woman is the man. But you put them all together, and when you put them all together... You're not going to come up with the viewpoint that some have. Now, Paul puts down this great principle. This is authority for the sake of order to eliminate confusion. The pastor who was having trouble in his church said to me several years ago, I asked him what the problem was. He says, I've got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Everybody wants to be a leader. And we have today leadership training in the church. I'd like to know where you find that in the Bible. We have certain organizations, they say they exist to 
train young people to be leaders, to speak. Paul says, study to be quiet. And I wish today that we could put the emphasis where the Bible puts it and get rid of this leadership training today. We don't need all of the leadership training. We need folk that will act and live like Christians. That's the important thing. Now, the important word here is head, if you'll notice. I know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. The head is the one that gives the directions. Now, here actually is where I think I disagree with my instructors. They say here, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. And they speak here of the Christian man. Well, the normal order here and the correct order is for Christ to be head of every man. This doesn't mean just to be a Christian man. Until a man is mastered by Christ, he's not a man. He's not normal Christian man. Now, there are those today that are mastered by drink. There are those today mastered by passion, those mastered by the flesh. But we need to be mastered by Christ. Augustine says our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, until we come and make him the head. And there's men that have done that. Martin Luther came to that place, and Wilberforce did, and Wilberforce had been a profligate. Augustine had been the same thing, Martin Luther and Augustinian monk. May I say to you that these men were mastered by Christ. And I hear today... He's a Christian man. Is he mastered by Christ? That's the important thing. That's what he's saying here. Now, the head of the woman is the man. There's no article with man. And it's not every woman. It's not an absolute. In marriage, woman is to respond to the man. That's the general principle. And it's normal, I think, for a woman to be subject to the man in marriage. A woman who cannot look up to a man and respect him, she ought not to follow him, and surely she ought not to marry him. That's the important thing. But a real woman responds with every fiber of her being to the man that she loves. But he must be the man that's willing to die for her. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan tells about that he and his wife had a friend, very brilliant woman. She had a very strong personality. She was outstanding, and she was not married. And he asked her one day the very pointed question, says, why have you never married? And she said, I've never found a man who can master me. And she never married. Well, until a woman finds that man, she'll make a mistake marrying Mr. Milto. She'll be in trouble from that day on. Now the head of Christ is God. This is tremendous. I and the Father are one, the Lord Jesus said. But he also said, my Father is greater than I. Now there's a great mystery here. In the work of redemption, he took a lower place voluntarily, made lower than the angels. He walked a lowly path way down here. We're told to let that same mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this is a section that has special application, I think, to Corinth. Your local situation, I think, could be different. Your church and community may be different than it was in Corinth. But in Corinth, this was the thing that was all important in that day. And I still believe it's a great principle for today, by the way. Now, In verse 4, he says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, he dishonoreth his head. Now, the rabbi in that day taught that a man was to cover his head. And Paul says that they actually misinterpreted Moses. They missed the whole point. Because over in 2 Corinthians 3, 13 It says, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, 
that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. The thing was that that glory in Moses' face was beginning to disappear after he came down from the mount. He covered his face so they wouldn't discover that, by the way. And that is the thing now that Paul is saying that you ought not to cover your head. A man created in the image of God who is in Christ by redemption is to have his head uncovered as a symbol of dignity and liberty. That is the thought that is here. And he's praying and prophesying. He's speaking for a man to God, prophesying, speaking for God to man. And standing in these two holy, sacred positions, he's to have his head uncovered. Now we come back today to this 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and we saw last time that Paul is saying here that he's put down a principle that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. Now, in Corinth, the woman was taking a different position altogether. They had the woman's liberation movement going in Corinth, years ago, was going apparently in the wrong direction. Now, we find here that Paul is saying in verse 5, and let me read it, "...but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven." Now, from that great principle, Paul draws this statement here. A man should have his head uncovered, and the woman should have her head covered. Paul is saying here when he is speaking for God. Praying means he's speaking for man to God, making intercession. Prophesying here means he's speaking for God to man. And he goes on to say, For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now, this has direct application to Corinth, and there are probably two things that we ought to say at this particular junction. Somebody is saying, you do not mean to say that God is giving instruction regarding trivialities like a woman's dress. Certainly God cannot be concerned with what a woman wears and whether a man gets a haircut and has his head uncovered. Well, the facts are that the Bible makes it clear that God is interested in what you wear and how you fix your hair. He says even the hairs of your head are numbered. And this idea that only your hairdresser knows, God knows, my friend. And he had a great deal to say about these and related subject. The very details of your lives come in under his inspection. You don't shut him out when you take a bath. The most intimate details of our lives are an open book to him. And can you name anything today, though, that takes up more space in newspapers, magazines, time on radio and TV than what men and women wear? Men's hair affords a lively discussion today. Now, let's see what the Word of God has to say. And we need to understand that these are questions that came from the church under in Corinth to Paul, and Paul's going to answer them. Now, he says, first of all, man's not to have his head covered, but a woman should have hers covered. Now, before we get into that, may I say this? He is saying here, but every woman that prayeth and prophesy, that means that a woman can pray in public, and it means she can speak in public. This idea today that the Bible just said that a woman could not do these things is entirely wrong. It is true there's never been a woman theologian. There's never been a great woman preacher. Now, somebody's going to disagree with me on that, but that's all right. The woman has the right if she has the gift. And by the way, some have it. I know several women today, right today, that are outstanding Bible teachers, and they can out-teach any man. 
A preacher told me this very kindly. He says, my wife is a much better Bible teacher than I am. And the member of the congregation, in fact, an officer in the church, said, we'd rather hear her speak any time than hear him speak. She has the gift. I'm not sure. In that case, maybe he ought to stay home and wash the dishes and let her do the preaching. But I don't mean to interfere in that family at all. Now, will you notice, he goes on to say here that she has her head uncovered. She dishonored her head. Now, we need to recognize that there was something that gave this a local application. Now, will you let me read the next verse? For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. Why? Well, it had a peculiar and particular application to Corinth. The unveiled woman in Corinth was a prostitute, and many of them were shaven. Up yonder at the temple of Aphrodite, there were thousand bestial virgins, so-called, but they were prostitutes. Heads were shaven. And the woman that came with her head uncovered, they were prostitutes. And the women in Corinth said, all things are lawful for me. Therefore, we don't need to cover our head. And this veil is the mark of subjection. It's a mark of subjection, not to a man, but to God. When you go into the church with your hat on or wearing a hat. Now, I think that was the application to Carter. And after all, isn't I had a morale builder for a woman today? The wife said to her husband, said, you know, said, every time I get down in the dump, says, I go buy me a new hat. And he said, well, I've been wondering where you got those hats. May I say to you, a hat's a morale builder for a woman. But the dress has to do with the ministry. If she is to lead, she ought to have her head covered. Now, if she's not, there's nothing wrong with her going in with that at all. In fact, there are several other passages, and I'll have to bring them up at this time. For instance, over in First Timothy, the second chapter, verses 8 through 10, Paul says, "...I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting." In like manner, he says, I will therefore that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair, gold, or pearls, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, what Paul is saying here is simply this, that if she is to lift up holy hands in the service, in leading why she is not to come adorning herself in this way. Why? Well, very candidly, the woman is not to use sex appeal in approaching God. That's it exactly, my friend. God says that she's not to use that at all. And she will never actually win her husband by that. Notice what Peter said in First Peter, the third chapter. He says, likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, will you notice what he says down in verse 4? He says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then he goes on to say in verse 7, "...likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge," that is, spiritual knowledge, "...giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered." And many a family today have their prayers hindered because the husband and wife are not getting along as they should and not using the proper approach. God is saying to the wife there in First Peter, you can't win your husband to Christ by sex appeal. Not that she's not to use it, but you'll never win anyone like that. Jezebel tried it, didn't work. Queen Esther tried it, didn't work. Salome tried it and didn't work. But those that really stand out in Scripture as being marvelous, wonderful, godly women that God used, Sarah, Deborah, Hannah, Abigail, and Mary 
the mother of Jesus. These are things that we have mentioned here. Now, will you notice as we move on down in this particular section here, he says in verse 7, now he's talking about this principle that he's given back up here as it applies to the man. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he's the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And that's a very important thing to keep in consideration. I'm not concerned about this women's liberation movement today at all. I believe that a woman's place is to be a helpmeet to the man and the other part of him. And no man is complete. Without a woman, there's no question about that. Now, the exceptions to that, of course. We'll have occasion to go into that later in other passages. Verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. And there is something, again, a reference to angels that I don't understand. But I'm of the opinion that we are being observed today by God's created intelligences And if you today knew that you're actually on on a stage in this little world and all uh, God's created intelligences are watching today, well, they're finding out about the love of God because they know we're not worthy of the love of God. God would have done well probably to have gotten rid of us, to have removed us from his creation, but he didn't. He loved us. And that display of his love is in his grace to save us. Now we see here, he goes on to say, verse 11, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. And this is the power of the woman. Hold her man because she's a woman. And the man hold his woman because he's a man. That is the marriage relationship, my friend. And when that doesn't exist, why, believe me, you don't have that which is God's ideal for any moment. Now, will you notice, verse 12, For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman. But all things are of God. You see, they're inseparable. No man is a sphere. He's a hemisphere. No woman is a sphere. This woman's liberation today. It's nonsense for either man or woman to talk about liberation. The man needs the woman. The woman needs the man. And that is the thing that is important. Liberty, my friend, the liberty is a glorious relationship in marriage today. That is the thing that is all important. Now, will you notice here, he said, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? And I personally feel like that no woman ought to call attention to herself. When she's in public, that is, speaking for the Lord or teaching a Bible class, uh, that sort of thing, it should be no appeal to sex, which is tremendous. Her appeal there is a tremendous thing. She has the power to either lift a man up or drag him down. Now, verse 14, "...doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him." Now, there is a verse needs a little comment, and well, I get the letters now. I think all of this long hair today is a result of one thing, and it's the result of the fact that man has not found his sufficiency in God. He is a frustrated individual, and that today multitudes, without seeing a great purpose in life for God, Go out with your hair cut and look up to heaven to your maker. But today to let the stuff grow down around you, you can't even recognize an individual. May I say to you, it's a movement toward the animal world without purpose in life at all. Now, well, I hear from that, but that's all right. I won't mind that at all. I'm accustomed to that. But here's a verse I'd like to put it up in public places all over this land today. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him. 
Now, there was a Nazarite vow back in the Old Testament. We've seen that, that man took, and they did it dedicated to God. One of the things, they were not to cut their hair. And that meant that they were willing to bear shame for God's sake. And actually, Samson was not a strong individual physically. He was a little dried up, weaselly little old man. He was a Mr. Milkos. Very feminine, by the way. His mama's boy tied to his apron string. Ran home when he saw a pretty girl and told his mama to get her for him. May I say to you, he had long hair. And it was because he was a Nazarite. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. And believe me, it may please those around you, but the angels today are ashamed of you. May I say that this is something that is a mark of a decadent age. Now, there's something else, though. We ought not to stop with that. And let me move on. But if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, let me say this. Why, today we have liberty in Christ. Now, my brother, if you want to grow long hair, you grow long hair. There's some men, they are not able to grow long hair. Several of my friends are coming out on top today, I'll tell you. Today, our moral values have been turned upside down, and there's a danger of being an extremist and going in either direction. There is a rebellion today against Puritan theology, and there is a danger, therefore, of moving in an extreme direction. It's like the lady who went to the psychiatrist, and her family had urged her to go. And so the psychiatrist asked her, says, what really seems to be your trouble? Well, she says, they think it's strange that I like pancakes. Oh, he says, well, there's nothing wrong in liking pancakes. Well, he says, you know, I like pancakes. She says, you do? Well, he says, well, come over sometime. I've got trunks filled with them. My friend, you can be an extremist, you see, in that which is a normal thing. You can let your hair grow too long if you're a man. Now, for a woman, it is her glory. But now Paul says that it's not really the haircut, and it's not the style of the dress after all. He says here, we have no such custom, neither in the churches of God. And I don't think the church ought to make rules in this connection at all about women's dress or men's hair today. It's the inner man. It's that old nature that really needs a haircut. And all of us need the robe of righteousness. And my friend, if we're clothed with the robe of righteousness, and this old nature of ours is under control of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is giving it a haircut, then may I say to you that I think that will take care of the outer man, and it wouldn't really make any difference about the dress. Paul says we really have no rule. Paul just telling you what he thinks and what would be best. After all, in Christian liberty, we are to think of others. And what is your testimony to others? Now, we come down to another section, and we go from one actual extreme here to the other, women's dress and men's hair, and we take up now the Lord's Supper. And this, my friend, is a very important and probably it is the most sacred, holy part of our relationship to God today. I'm confident that this is something, the Lord's Supper, that's greatly misunderstood in our churches and that as a result, why it's almost blasphemy the way that it's observed in some places. And Paul is going to say here that God judges you in the way that you observe the Lord's Supper. And that among the Corinthians, actually, there were some that were sick and some had died. Why? Well, but simply because of the way that they observed the Lord's Supper. They did not discern the body of Christ. I wonder if we do today. The thing that most of us observe is 
uh, method that is used. We note every detail of the ritual. But do we really discern the body of Christ in the Lord's Supper? They've asked questions about this, and Paul has heard certain things that were taking place in Corinth. Now, the very interesting thing is that all four Gospels record the institution of the Lord's Supper. Not all of them have the birth of Christ, but they all have the Lord's Supper, which speaks of his death. The Lord did not request that the church remember his birthday, but he did request and command that those that are his own remember his death day. And Paul attached the utmost importance to it. And if you'd like to know just how important it was, Paul says here, way down in verse 23 of the 11th chapter, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. Now, that he received by direct revelation. Paul puts it on par with the gospel, because over here in the 15th chapter, Paul thus says concerning the gospel, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Now, the direct revelation was of the gospel, and the direct revelation was of the Lord's Supper. The Lord gave him special instructions concerning it. Now, that means that he received the gospel by revelation. He received the Lord's Supper. See, he was not present in the upper room. And now he's able to say, I delivered unto you here, and that he received of the Lord that which he says I'm delivering unto you. Now, it's rather difficult, I admit, to see the connection of what Paul says to the Corinthian church with our celebration of the Lord's Supper. And as we've said, there's no exact parallel, but there does happen to be a similar situation. Now, in that day, the Lord's Supper was preceded by a social meal. It was celebrated probably in the home, and probably daily. They probably had the celebration of the Lord's Supper like that. In fact, right after the day of Pentecost, we're told in verse 46 of chapter 2 of Acts, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And Aristides, an Athenian philosopher, he lived in the early part of the second century, and he describes the way the Christians of his day live their lives. Now, I'm quoting from him. He says, "...every morning and all hours and on account of the goodness of God towards them, they praise and laud him. And if any righteous person of their number passes away from the world, they rejoice and give thanks to God. If a child chance to die in its infancy, they praise God mightily, as for one who has passed through this world without committing a sin. Now, that is a statement of an outsider of the church in the second century. So that the church in Corinth followed the procedure, actually, of having a meal in connection with the Lord's Supper. And after all, the Passover was that kind of a celebration. In the upper room, remember, our Lord celebrated the Passover supper. And we are told as they were eating, Jesus took bread. That's in Matthew 26, 26. And our Lord, on the dying embers of a fading feast, he did something new. Out of the ashes of that dead feast, he erected something new. Now, today we have a custom that's... uh, custom of 
clubs and fraternities and even of churches, savings banks, insurance companies, that they have a meal, a get-together. It's a sort of a time of fellowship. Now, the church would come together in that day for a supper, for a meal. Great many folk criticize church banquets. And I have, too, when they've become nothing in the world but an attention given to the physical man. But the early church had them, and they called it the agape, or the love feast. And it was part of the koinonia, the fellowship of the church. And in that day, the social gathering led right into the Lord's Supper, that is, the Eucharist. Now, these feasts were finally separated, and they're not practiced today. You do not have a dinner that leads into the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Now, there is a message, though, in spite of that for us, and let's see if we can locate it. I go back and read verse 17 chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Now in this that I declare unto you, and that word declare, by the way, is command, and unto you is not in the, well, it's in italics, means it's actually not in the text. It should be, now in this that I command, and this now is a command from Paul, he says, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. In other words, they should have come together for a great spiritual blessing, but it didn't amount to that. Actually, they were worse off. What had happened? For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear... Now, when you come together in the church, he's not talking about an edifice, a building. He's talking about when the believers came together. We always identify a building with the church. We say, well, the Methodist church or the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the independent church is down on the next corner. Well, it's not down on the next corner. The church is art. It's closed up. Nobody's there. And that's not a church, just a building. Church of the people. But it's difficult for us to think in a context like that. For first of all, when you come together in the church, that is, as the believers come together, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. In other words, the party spirit was carried over into the Lord's Supper, that division that was there. And now notice verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Now, this explains the cults and isms of Southern California. Why does God permit them? Well, have you ever noticed sometimes that when your wife or mother or the cook is cooking something and there is accumulation of something on top and she takes a skimmer and just skims it off? Well, that's what God does. The church is filled today, I think, with unbelievers, tell the truth. A large percentage of people in the sum total of all the churches, they're not saved at all. They're just members of a church. Now, the Lord, he skims them all. How? Well, they go into cults and isms. That's what he says here. He says very candidly, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. A heresy comes along, one of these cults says them, a lot of people go out of churches and flock to it. Why? Well, because the Lord's skimming them all, my friend. That which is genuine may be revealed. Now he says in verse 20, When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is, and you notice this is, is in italics. It should be, it's not possible to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, it's impossible for them to celebrate the Lord's Supper because of the way that they have this feast that preceded it. Under these circumstances, they couldn't celebrate the Lord's Supper. Now, he continues on. Verse 21, he says, "...for an eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken." And believe me, what a comment that is. Here, some poor fellow, he came to the dinner... He couldn't even bring a covered plate of scalloped potatoes. And that, my friend, is the limit. He couldn't bring a few scalloped potatoes. 
And because of that, he was hungry. And there sat next to him a rich fellow, and he had fried chicken and ice cream for dessert. And he's not passing anything to this poor man. You see, that fellowship's broken. That's not fellowship when you do like that. Always at the church picnic, I always made a point of circulating around at the meal time. Everybody opens up their little picnic basket, and they have their picnic dinner there. And a lot of folks share, but I always went up and down and just helped myself because I think that that's what it should be. I think that it's a time of fellowship. And my friend, it's not a fellowship unless you share with me and I share with you. That's what was happening. And as a result, it was tragic. This man actually was hungry. And they don't give him anything. Well, that's not fellowship by any means. And then there was something else. What? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Or despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say unto you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. What had happened? Verse 22, what? Have ye not houses to eat and drink in? Now, what was happening here was just simply this. They were fracturing and rupturing the church. And in its visible way, why, they should have shared everything. And then there was some getting drunk during this agape, the love feast. And they were in no condition to remember the death of Christ at all. It was all fuzzy and hazy to them. And now Paul gives that which he got by direct revelation. He says again, I praise you not. And then he asks the question, shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Now, verse 23. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. I hear people say they want to celebrate the Lord's Supper just exactly like the Lord did. And then they have 11 o'clock morning service. Well, if you want to have it at the proper time, it would be at night. They went in at night. They eat the Passover feast. And if you wanted to pick out the right time, it wouldn't be 11 o'clock morning service. I instituted for a while in several churches in which I've served an evening communion and every other time of having it in the evening service. Well, you should have heard the amount of criticism that came at first. Oh, we want to celebrate it like the Lord did. I said, well, that's the reason we're having it at night. He instituted it at night. Listen to Paul. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now, he got this as a direct revelation of the Lord. And Paul wasn't present in the upper room. And it was the night that the forces of hell met to destroy our Savior. And I think the simplicity and sublimity of this supper is tremendous, and the sanity of it. Notice what he did. It says, when he had given thanks, he gave thanks that night while the shadow of the cross hung over the upper room. Sin was knocking at the door of the upper room, demanding its pound of flesh, and he gave thanks. He gave thanks to God. Now he break it. And there's always been a difference of opinion among believers on that. Should you break the bread or serve it as it is? Well, may I say to you, Romanism breaks it. Lutheranism does not. And most Protestant churches don't. I instituted again something else, that the one that served the bread before the congregation take a piece and break it right before him. That speaks of the broken body of our Lord. Bengal made this statement. He says, "...the very mention of the breaking involves distribution and refutes the Corinthian plan, every man for himself." They were to share this. This was something they were to share. Now, will you notice? He says, after the same manner also, 
He took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now, the bread speaks of his broken body, not bones, broken body. And now this speaks of the new covenant. This is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. And it's always called the cup, if you'll notice. Drink this cup. And Luke speaks of the fruit of the vine. Never is it called wine. May I say that I believe it was unfermented. Somebody says, why do you say that? Well, this was the Passover feast. And they were serving unleavened bread. Do you think that they served the leavened fruit of the vine, which would be wine? Oh, no. They would never have unleavened bread and leavened grape juice. The body is the cup that holds the blood. And that blood speaks of his death. And it wasn't contaminated blood like mine or yours. It was not leavened. It was unleavened grape juice, if you please. I believe that with all my heart. Now, verse 26. Paul now adds something new. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show forth the Lord's death till he come. Now, the Lord's Supper is a commemoration. You do this, he says, in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. Verse 25. And that looks back to the past. That looks back to the time that he died on the cross. The Lord's Supper is a commemoration in remembrance of him. But it's a communion. He's the living Christ today at God's right hand. And it means of my present vital relationship with Jesus Christ. But it also looks to the future. It's a commitment. This do ye, he says, you do show forth the Lord's death till he come. And it looks down through the halls of history. And at that day, it was in the future. And it's still in the future, the coming of Christ for his church. It's a commitment on the part of those in view of that. Now, friends, what he did, he took these frail and fragile elements that had spoiled before the next week, and he erected a monument, not of marble, of bronze, or silver, or gold, but the simplest elements in the world, most familiar, bread and drink. Now, what does it mean to discern the Lord's body. Let's keep reading. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh... Now, unworthily is not here in verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, there have always been three interpretations of it. Romanism says, hocus meum corpus. This, that is, these elements, are the actual blood and body of Christ. Well, I have only one thing to say about that. That's actually true. Then you're cannibal if you eat in his body actually. Then Luther didn't come too far away from that, and his teaching was consubstantiation. And he said, by, in, through, with, and under, and over the bread, you get the body of Christ. Well, it's difficult for me to understand that. And then there are those that say it's a symbol, and that's been a Protestant viewpoint. Zwingli taught that, just a symbol. It's more than that. It's meaningful. There's something there for us. And it means you've got to discern the body of Christ. It means this. You have bread in your mouth, but you have Christ in your heart. My friend, that's the thing that's important. You remember when he went yonder on that Emmaus road? He had a meal with him. And then what did he do? He revealed himself. That was the Lord's Supper. Oh, may he reveal himself in this supper to you and to me today. Now, he says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Why? They've done it unworthily. 
For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. But when we are judged of the Lord, we are chastened, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, if we can judge ourselves when we're wrong, if we don't, he'll judge us. If we're believers, why? Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, tear one for another. And I uh, should add this, that we should not be condemned with the world. He's going to judge the world. Therefore, he has to deal with his own now. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Now, there were other things wrong in Corinth, but Paul didn't write about them. He says, when I get there, I'm going to straighten those out. But these are the things. He's going to change the subject. He's going to move from the carnalities to the spiritualities. And that's what he wanted to talk about at the very beginning. But they had all of these problems, all these hang-ups, just like we have today. And that's the reason they're important to us today.